This is the, the second panel of the morning, uh, Rethinking Aid Financing, How Locally-Led Organizations Are Funding Their Futures. It's presented by the New Humanitarian, Start Network, Near Network, and the White Helmets. Uh, my name's Erwin Loy. I'm the policy editor at the New Humanitarian. We're a, a nonprofit newsroom that covers global crises and the people who are trying to respond to them. Uh, just a quick couple of housekeeping things. This event is being live streamed, uh, so hello to everyone watching online. Uh, we've got a really tight schedule, about an hour, uh, to, and a lot to get through. Uh, so I'm going to encourage everyone to be quite brief, but I think we'll have time to, to get to everything. And a bit of time for questions at the end as well. So here in the audience, please think of uh, some of the things you'd like to ask our panelists. Uh, and online, please tweet and tag, uh, or X and tag, New Humanitarian. Um, and there's this QR code you can scan behind us uh, and I'll give you links to all our organizations and some of the, the things we talk about uh, will come up and you can sign up for TNH's weekly newsletter. Um, so just a quick intro to the topic. I don't think anyone here needs a long intro to localization. Uh, you know, the reforms have been talked about underway for years in, in, in the aid sector and there's not been a lot of movement in terms of getting uh, actual power and money closer to the ground. Um, but, you know, in, in, there are some policy changes, but in practice, uh, I think we'll hear, we all know that things aren't quite moving as fast as people want. Um, but local groups are finding workarounds for a system that's not working as fast as they are. Um, they're finding new donors, new ways of funding. They're collaborating. Uh, they're collaborating with, with each other, other to share resources uh, as opposed to competing for the same dwindling resources. And they're exper experimenting with new models of getting funding to the ground faster. So this panel is meant to highlight some of what's going on and talk about uh, what's happening sometimes in the shadows, maybe outside of the, the spotlight of big aid. Uh, we're gonna hear how leaders are taking matters into their own hands and we're gonna share some of that knowledge and maybe spark a few ideas. Um, but first, to start us off, uh, I'm going to turn to Marsha Wong, who's the Deputy Assistant Administrator in USAID, USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. Uh, get started, please. Great, thank you. I've been told by Irwin I must use the mic. Does this work? No? <laughs> Darn it. Okay, so I do need to use the mic. Darn okay. it. Um, thank you, Erwin, and good morning, everyone. And it is a real pleasure to see all of you in real life and in good health. And also, thank you to all the virtual participants who are beaming in today, too. It is a, an honor and a privilege to be on the stage with many of these colleagues who I know um, the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance has had some long and strategic engagements and partnerships with. And we will continue to learn from all of you on uh, earn what is a very critical topic at a critical time. I have a feeling that there are many in this room who may be working 24-7 now on the truly tragic events that took place in Morocco and Libya in the last week. And we are still continuing to work on the global protracted crises, the climate shocks, and the long-term humanitarian and development challenges. So critical topic, critical time. Um, what I wanted to be able to do is tell you a little bit, if I may, on first of all, let me assure you that BHA is fully aware how difficult it is. And we need to take on the responsibility of being one of the biggest donors in humanitarian assistance to make it less difficult to have funding going to the local organizations. Um, even this morning, if you can bear with me, and Erwin's gonna grab the mic at some point, um, I was looking through the remarks that were prepared for me and I felt I need to give you a, a little bit of a, a pulse check on where we are. Keep, keep the pressure on us. These conversations actually will do that. Keep the learning going um, and keep the reporting on our metrics candid and honest too, because if we're not hitting it, we're not hitting it. So I wanted to put that out there as a, as a plea to all of you. Um, BHA certainly has a history to build on. We have done, you know, um, if we may, localization work, um, particularly in the areas of disaster risk management, Asia and Latin America, Caribbean are really good examples for that. But we know there's urgency behind this and we have to accelerate those efforts. Um, I think it's useful if I can, because I am going to go to my notes now, because I really want to make sure that you recognize what we're trying to do. Um, I want to do a shout out, if I may, to everybody on this, this panel and to all of you in the room, because I think you have been, um, no velvet gloves, uh, some of you have been quite candid and pointed with us on just where the obstacles and impediments are. 
um, through convenings that have been managed by our colleagues in Interaction and ICVA. The grand bargain process also has put pressure on the system to look at what reforms and revisions, reviews need to accelerate that direct funding to the, lo to the local organizations. But again, it is certainly not, not easy at all. Um, I also wanted to add a note to all of this, that it is direct funding, but we also make sure that there's also shared capacity and learning and knowledge built up too. As I was talking with some of our friends here this morning, it would be irresponsible of us as being one of the world's biggest donors to say, here it is, go, without knowing that you have the management and organizational skills um, to be able to, at the end of the day, help us on the, the very much needed, very much required need for oversight, accountability, to ensure we have the impact. One dollar, one billion dollars, everything is, still has to have that sense of oversight, accountability, and impact. But at the same time, we have to make sure that our local partners feel they can do that um, responsibly with us. So, it, so we recognize it is a, a complex uh, growth path that we all are with each other now at the moment. Um, I also wanted just to point out that, if I may, each donor faces its own constraints and flexibilities that we have. We need to exploit more of those flexibilities. I know all of you certainly um, recognize that and tell us to. Um, as the world's largest donor, we recognize if we can be more flexible and streamline what that impact can be times 100, right? Um, so I wanted to, to let you know that, and I, I'm not going to tell you the acronym because it sounds like I don't know, some sort of bodily function. So I'm not going to tell you what the acronym is, but we are right now undertaking a very, very urgent, um, critical review and redesign of our processes and systems. Um, it's informed by much of the input from, from colleagues up here on the stage and with all of you. Um, it is to streamline, it is to accelerate, it is to, if I may, and this is Marcia, if we can, shed the bureaucratic barnacles, is how I look at it. There are things that weigh us down what can we shed responsibly, um, but just has accretion over the years. How do we shed the bureaucratic, uh, bureaucratic barnacles with the, game, with the goal and the aim of, of moving more funding and skill sets out? Um, it, importantly in all of this, it's not all, only just you know, who gets the funding, but also who has the voice. You talked about mic. I can get you to the table, but I got to make sure you got a mic too. And so everything we do, even if it's you to me, um, to working through an international organization, how do we ensure that, again, the, the voice and decision making is going to be held primarily in the local hands? So, so that is some, a, a, a thread that runs through all of our thinking right now. Um, if I can, Irvin, just one more minute, please. Um, uh, climate, climate finance. That is a big issue for us, a big advocacy point, and again, the impact of that. Because when we look at climate impact and climate shocks, who's most likely going to be the first that feel it. It's going to be the local organizations and communities. And if they don't have the resources to step forward fast, or they haven't had the resources to prepare and to mitigate or to adapt, then we are in that doom loop of climate impact on local communities and constantly trying to work together to break that. So I wanted just to point out that climate finance is also an area that we're looking at with a real specific eye and how to move it into the so-called FCV context but within those contexts to these local communities and, and truly first responders. So I wanted to um, just do a little preview and I wish I were able to announce it, but the lawyers are on me. Um, last year at the COP, we announced uh, up to 200 million, up to five year climate ready um, disaster, um, sorry, I'm gonna get that wrong, climate smart and disaster ready um, adaptation, adaptation initiative. Um, work the team, I really, really insisted that have an intentional focus on local organizations. Um, I hope in the next few months we'll be able to, there we go, there goes the brilliance. Um, I hope in the next few months we'll be able to announce the first round of new local partners. And when we can appropriately, you're going to have to bear with me another minute, um, where we can appropriately share some of the lessons, um, the opportunities, but truly some of the challenges to move money to new, perhaps new partners altogether. Not an easy walk, but has to be done. Um, I talked a little bit about you know critical topic at a critical time. I talked a little bit about how we all need to ensure as donors the right skill sets, the right responsibilities, the, the, the ability to manage it, um, uh, oversight, and impact. We want to be there with you because we owe each other that. 
Um, and where we can, again, responsibly as the biggest donor, where can we shed those bureaucratic barnacles? And then with you all having those right skills, how do we get out of the way? And therefore, getting out of the way, Erwin, I'm going to segue. do that right now um, and turn it over to your panel. Thank you. <laughs> thanks so much, Marsha. Uh, so uh, thanks for setting us up. Uh, we're going to do two rounds of quick questions, and then we'll have a time for Q&A at the end. So my first question is to Hibat Kalfin, who is the executive director for the Network for Empowered Aid Response. Uh, Hibak, NIR is a global south network uh, that has a goal of reshaping aid. So I'm interested in, in, in your vision of what is the future of aid financing in an ideal world. What, what does a, a better aid financing model look like? Thank you. Can you, does it work? Um, just to say thank you. Thank you for the, the, the panel. Um, for us, this is not, this process is not from a, a vacuum. We started um, in 2016 when we were launched at the World Humanitarian Summit and very much focused initially on the 25% commitment. Um, and from there, it was how do we unlock that 25%? And quickly we realized it wasn't just around advocacy, it wasn't around practice reform, but it was around building new solutions. And so we went on a journey for four years to try and learn what are the different uh, actors, different local actors doing in different sectors. So we looked into peace building, we looked into development, we looked in community foundations, um, and we developed a financing strategy. And that financing strategy was how do we ensure that the system starts to give to uh, organizations, taking into account the capacity and, and the fact that you know, we're not homogeneous as, as local organizations. We have organizations within our network who have $50,000 a year budgets and $60 million a year budgets. So very capable of being able to absorb the resources. And over time, I think we started to think through the sector, what it really needed. And, and interestingly enough, COVID, I think, kicked us a little bit in our backs and, and made us realize that it needed actual solutions, tangible solutions to be able to pilot, to be able to scale. And so we started developing local financing mechanisms. We started in Somalia, and that one's very hyper-focused to um, the communities and how to get uh, informal groups funding directly uh, during response, but also how to build to an agnostic fund that allows for to us to respond to the needs of, of the communities. Uh, in Syria, with the, the recent earthquake, we were able to work with uh, the Syrian National League Network to be able to get money out the door pretty quickly. Um, and develop a, a fund there. We're working in Nepal and with other, other, other different groups. And in 2021, we started with the support of the Hilton Foundation, uh, a change fund, uh, a global fund that allows us to get money out the door to our members in the beginning while we're piloting this within 72 hours. And the most important, I think, component of that, which we're continuing to learn, is around the governance structure. All decisions are made by our members. Uh, we have members that have been elected into the governance structure. They make all decisions of where crisis, which crisis we should support, how we should support it, how much funding we should give. And they are taking a, a lived experience to take from the panel that, that we just had um, on, on making those decisions. And from there, we were able to get $1.5 million out the door in 67 days. Um, and you can imagine, uh, we would have been able, with that same capacity of volunteers and staff within the Secretariat, been able to get $10 million out just in the first year. And so we're on this path of trying to figure out what can we do, what kind of infrastructure can we build uh, to be able to get resources to local actors and to be able to have proof of concept for bilateral donors and other donors to be able to get resources to local actors as well. Thanks, Ibak. Uh, I'm going to turn to Christina now to build on, on some of that. Uh, Christina is the CEO, Christina Bennett is the CEO of Start Network, uh, which includes dozens of local, national, and international organizations among its membership. Uh, Christina, you wrote a piece in the New Humanitarian uh, this year, shameless plug. You said the international aid system is dragged down by its own inertia, while local aid organizations are finding ways around the roadblocks. Uh, can you tell us what are some of the, the, the new ways of securing funding that, that you've seen that really excite you? Great, thanks very much, and thanks for having me. I'm a last minute stand in. We were hoping to have one of our local leaders on this panel, but the US uh, visa process would have said it otherwise. So here I am, CEO of Start Network, a membership organization across the globe of national, international, and local organizations working across six continents and through locally led hubs. 
Um, what we have in common is a vision for changing the humanitarian aid system by shifting uh, power, by shifting resources, um, by shifting practice so that uh, local organizations can benefit from more um, and be able to operate more efficiently and more ethically in the crises that we respond to. Um, and importantly, we do all of this through practical action. So like Hibak was saying, you know, we, we have seen where um, commitments have fallen short of, of what people want to see. Um, and so we try to model the change that we want to see by putting into practice different ways of operating, trialing them, evidencing whether they work or not, and then exporting them when they are successful. So, the question um, for this panel is how are local organizations taking matters into their own hands and finding their own funding? And I guess I would say that it's in, you know, we've seen this a lot in Start Network and some of it has to do with money and some of it doesn't have to do with money. Um, certainly our local organizations are raising funds. Um, in Pakistan, for example, um, the pa locally led Pakistan hub was able to raise 4 million euros from the German government in anticipation of the catastrophic floods in Balochistan and Sin province in the summer of 2022. And that's a global level fundraising um, for a lot of money. But then on the other end of the spectrum, we have a community-based member in Bangladesh that raised a smaller amount of money from a local bank in order to be able to protect fishermen by giving them food um, when there was a ban on fishing in their community. And then we have an organization in India um, that really went after multi-year funding from uh, a UN organization. In order to do that, worked really hard on developing and improving its financial systems to be able to meet the requirements of that multi-year funding. So now working with a UN agency on that and also working uh, with Google. So what do all of these organizations ha have in common? They have um, expertise. Um, recognized expertise, expertise that's recognized by the, by the donors that fund them. And I think it's really important that those donors see the value in that expertise in their own right. What they also have is a real um, dedication to proving that they are good financial managers. I think one of our humanitarian imperatives is to do really well with money and spend money in the right way. And so what do they, um, how are they doing this? They are improving their financial systems and demonstrating that they can manage those funds effectively. And third, what do they have? Social capital. Social capital through their networks and their peer groups that they build together. So working together to share learning, to share experiences, to work um, together to be able to demonstrate financial capabilities and financial support. Um, but I wanted to just make a, another point about the fact that it's not just money that these organizations um, are working on, that there's a whole, there's a, there's a lot that goes on behind fundraising um, that local organizations are doing together. One, they are going after quality funding. Quality funding is sustained funding. It is, um, it is multi-year funding. It is investment in their organizations. And they're doing that, again, by demonstrating that they are good financial managers, managers and really spending time and money to be building up their financial systems um, and improving that to demonstrate their financial capabilities. They are also um, advocating um, for their own visibility and their own credibility by going to global forums to talk about their work. So our hub in Pakistan led our, uh, our work and our advocacy at COP27 last year in Sharm El Sheikh, talking about their, their responses to the floods. We had two um, of our local leaders from the D Democratic Republic of Congo and from South Sudan at the Africa Climate, Regional Climate Week last week, talking about their work. And we have our partner in Guatemala in Asexa talking at ADEX um, about the work that they're doing with community innovation there. All three of those opportunities led to direct conversations with funders. So um, it's not all about money. It's about what happens behind the money that local organizations are doing in spades. Thanks. Thanks, Christina, especially for wrapping that up in succinct five minutes. Um, I'll turn right now to, to Degan Ali. Uh, she's the executive director of Adesso, a Kenya-based humanitarian and development organization. Um, Degan, Adesso is in the middle of developing the proximate fund for Africa. The idea is that it will be a $1 billion pool of funding that can fund local civil society organizations at scale. I think you and Adesso push for transformational change in your work. I'm wondering, what do you think makes this transformational? What makes it different from what exists today? Yeah, um, I think uh, what Hibak talked about is, um, you know, 
the idea that we as the global south have to come up with our own solutions to our own problems and um, and we're trying to do that and we're trying to be propositional and coming up with new ideas constantly and so there is a recognition and appreciation that intermediation needs to happen the issue is not intermediation is the quality of the intermediation and where decision and power lies in that intermediation. Are you going to be making decisions in DC or the Bay Area or are you making decisions in DRC on which civil society organizations actually get money in that country? And so with the proximate fund in Africa, it's just a natural follow-up to the change fund where we're saying in Africa, why can't we do a big bet philanthropy? We're not really focusing on the bilaterals, but it can be a solution later um, to the bilaterals. And I think this is where philanthropy is really important because they can take uh, the risk and de-risk it for bilaterals and take that first step in making things happen. And so we are designing a fund um, that is doing a couple things. One, we want to fund the invisible organizations that not the donor dollars that everybody talks about when they come to Kenya, um, not the guys that can absorb a $5 million grant. We are talking about so small CBOs at $5,000 grant is impactful grant size to the $1 million. Um, there are medium-sized organizations that can easily absorb $1 million that are still fairly invisible. So we're looking at those small to medium-sized organizations. That's one. Secondly, we're looking at funding at the national level. So I'm sitting in Kenya. I can't make decisions for South African civil society organizations about their priorities. And while we are a pan-African fund, uh, we also need to uh, practice what we preach and democratize and decentralize decision making. So what we want to do is fund existing national infrastructure. So if there's a civil society led fund like in Ghana, there's Star Ghana, we would work with Star Ghana and give them the money and the Ghanaian uh, uh, NGOs make a decision about who they fund, how much to absorb, all of that, whether to give them a $5,000 grant or a $100,000 grant. Um, so this link to that is we want to develop infrastructure where it doesn't exist. So a place like Chad, there is no, as far as we know now, there isn't a civil society led fund. So we would work with uh, Near Network um, to, f to work with our members in Chad to help develop a civil society fund in Chad. So it, infrastructure building is really, really important. Um, why do we have small, really uh, localized uh, community foundations all over the north? And we don't think that that should be the norm in the south. That's what we should be thinking about, not only about a Nairobi, a country, a Kenyan-led fund, but a Nairobi fund, a, 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 a Kakuma fund, a, a you know, Kusumu fund, you know, a Garissa fund. I mean, these things should be existing. Um, and so uh, that's where we want to get to eventually. We're not there yet, but we should s say that the infrastructure we have invested in and built over the past 50 years in the global north, that level of investment is needed also in the south. And then third, they're recognizing that there are resources in the south, and that's why we want to invest in this infrastructure. So we would go to the KCDF, the Kenyan Community Development Foundation in Kenya, and say, hey, there's a drought um, in uh, Kenya that's happening. Go raise from money from the public and the private sector for every dollar you raise. The, the proximate fund would match it. So the idea is is mobilize and uh, help um, leverage our resources to mobilize more local philanthropy. And lastly, um, de-risk African billionaires and millionaires by saying we've already have money from Global North Philanthropy. You in um, in Nigeria or in South Africa, why don't you put some money into this pot to support your South African civil society or your Nigerian civil society? So we are also trying to work with African Philanthropy Forum as a strategic partner in addition to NIR to help us uh, mobilize African philanthropy, both at the local level, small donors, but also large level. Thanks, Dickin. Uh, I want to come back to you later about uh, the difference in, in the focus on philanthropic donors. I think that's really interesting. But we'll move on first uh, to Farouk, who's sitting to my right. Uh, Farouk Habib is uh, the Deputy General Manager and Head of External Affairs with the White Helmets, which, is, of course, is a volunteer-led organization that emerged in Syria, largely as rescue teams, but you've changed a lot over the years. Um, so, Farouk, the White Helmets have evolved to become a locally-led organization that receives funding from major donors. Can you tell us a bit about the process of, of building that up, about securing that funding, and what sort of, uh, I, su I suppose, trade-offs are required when you're dealing with 
the traditional humanitarian donors, or, or in what ways do they change to meet, where, meet your needs? Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Well, it has been uh, a long journey, indeed. We, uh, the, the, civil the local civil defense teams started in Syria in 2012 as the grassroots groups in different parts, not connected, not well organized. And gradually, by 2013, uh, we, uh, we had different bodies of coordination at uh, provincial or uh, regional level. Then by end of 2014, for the first time, we had the first general assembly meeting for leaders from every part of uh, Syria, and they formed the, the, the national umbrella which was led in the beginning just by a coordination committee, so it wasn't a full merge. But then over the following years, these uh, regional bodies were merged and gradually you had one uh, uh, yeah, uh, homogeneous uh, national organization uh, leading the uh, emergency response, search and rescue, and a lot of uh, health activities in the region. Um, at the same time, we've been developing our partnerships with our uh, donors and supporters globally. And uh, what we've learned uh, through this uh, process is that it's not necessarily about having direct funding. It's about having direct relationship, direct uh, partnership, getting your voice heard, and having uh, reliable uh, partners who can also support with the advocacy and you can outsource many of the uh, services and needs you have to, to get that uh, consolidated. Um, don not all donors were receptive in the beginning, but uh, uh, we knew that we have a homework on our side as well, and uh, we need to overcome any uh, pre assumptions or judgments, and we need to prove ourselves. And we got a lot of support from, from our people first and from the public uh, globally, which helped us to make that change. Can I ask you quickly, since you responded so quickly, um, can you talk about what those assumptions are from donors' perspectives? Like, what did you have to prove to them, and how do you go about doing that? Well, uh, there is that pre assumption that uh, local organizations cannot do the same job as uh, Western organizations. Yeah, that, that exists. We cannot deny it. And uh, we proved uh, the opposite. And it's not about the uh, nationality or the color of the people who are managing uh, these funds. It's about the system. And uh, we proved our uh, legitimacy. So donors, when they talk to the white helmets, they know that they are not talking to a traditional NGO which is looking for funding for its project. They talk to a legitimate civil society group, a leading uh, actor on the ground representing their community. So that's very important because uh, donors, especially we talk about government donors, they uh, they keen also to make sure that uh, their support is uh, relevant and it uh, also meets expectations of their uh, public. So we provide them with that uh, assurance. Again, it wasn't easy. It wasn't the same process with every donor and with every partner. But uh, we, uh, I believe, uh, to a large extent, we have overcome these uh, re assumptions, and we have been uh, reasonable and understandable. We knew that this, we will face these barriers from the beginning, and we need to be patient. We shouldn't rush. Thank you, Farouk. We'll come back and talk more about that. Uh, I'd like to turn to my left to Rory Stewart. Thanks for joining us from the next room. I hope that podcast went well. Looking forward to that. Uh, Rory is president of the Give Directly, which is, of course is a, a poverty reduction, has a goal of poverty reduction, uh, largely through direct tra cash transfers. Uh, previously, Rory held several roles in the UK government, uh, including Secretary of State for International Development, which I think is quite relevant to this conversation. Um, Rory, we're hearing about all these challenges and, and opportunities for local organizations. and. Essentially, they're looking for workarounds for a system that hasn't changed very fast uh, when it comes to localization. I'm wondering, from your time in government, can you, can you tell us how donor governments view localization? What, 
people are talking about here, how they view it and how that's changed? Well, I, I think it's a hugely difficult problem. I, I think we have to be honest about the fact that uh, international development organizations remain surprisingly old-fashioned and rigid. There's a lot of jargon, there's a lot of good chat, but the truth is that they've been doing things in a certain way for 70 years, and, and they find it bureaucratically very difficult to change. Um, I mean, some thoughts in relation to what we're talking about today. I, I think that the first thing is we really must put recipients first. And we need to drive this conversation through the question of what the interests of the recipients, the interests of the extreme poor are, rather than the question of the interests of the development agencies or the particular NGOs. And we have to be very rigorous in assessing what the impact is on the extreme poor, how much actually reaches them and how much their lives are changed. And we need to find ways of continuing to invest in randomized control trials and other forms of really assessing rigorously what actually happens through this intervention. I think there's no doubt at all that the current situation is absurd. There is a completely surreal gap between the global north and the global south. It is mad. It's mad to imagine a situation in which $200 billion a year is spent by people who have often only the most imperfect understanding of what is actually going on on the ground, who are imposing one-size-fits-all theories on communities and structures which they have very little contact with. That cannot be the right way to do things. The right way, of course, to approach this kind of problem, particularly when you're dealing with communities whose lives are very, very difficult, very alien, very remote, is to get decision-making down to the lowest possible level. So a lot of this is about a theory of decentralization. It's about taking power away from centers and driving power down to a local level. In doing that, we need to think, I think, about three things. Uh, we need to think about subsidiarity, we need to think about accountability, and we need to think about cost. Uh, what do I mean by subsidiarity? By subsidiarity, I mean literally drive it down to the lowest possible level. Right? The solution to people in New York or Washington or London or Paris uh, dealing with a problem in Eastern Congo is not to simply replace that with somebody sitting in the capital city in Western DRC speculating about what's happening in Eastern DRC. The fact that you are national is not sufficient. You need people who are much, much, much closer to these communities. So driving down to the lowest possible level is absolutely vital. Second question is a question of accountability. And, and, and in honor of the SDGs, what I'm talking about here is not unique to international development. This is true in British government, right? The, the truth is that a community on the Scottish-English border knows more, cares more, can do more than a distant official sitting in London. And the solution to that is not to simply move power from London to Manchester. It's to move power closer to that community on the English-Scottish border. Again, in the British context, the second point of that is accountability. It's not enough to say some local institution on the, the English-Scottish border is responsible. Is that institution, they may be local, is it accountable? And how does it actually control its revenue? Because money is often power in these contexts. If the money is coming from somewhere else, it's very, very difficult for that local organization to have full accountability or responsibility for its expenditure. How do we hold that organization to account if, as often happens with local organizations in Britain, they are not performing efficiently and effectively for those communities. And the final thing is cost. We can waste an enormous amount of money involved in trying to create ever more perfect programs through ever more detailed consultations, ever more detailed needs assessments, ever more complex procurement mechanisms, ever more complex monitoring and evaluation to try to ensure we're doing exactly the right thing. But when I was the Secretary of State in DFID, I saw programs in which $40,000 for a water sanitation program in a Zambian school resulted in $2,000 being spent on two latrines and five red plastic buckets. The other $38,000 had been absorbed in the needs assessments, the consultations, the procurement mechanisms. It is beyond imagination. And, and the question we need to ask, not just for international organizations, but local organizations, is, and this is where I'm going to 
complete special interest. I believe in many cases, the most radical form of decentralization is not to move from the international to the local, but it is to give unconditional cash to the individual in that community. Instead of wasting money on needs assessing them, consulting them, pretending you understand the culture of a village on the Burundi-Rwanda border, really say, actually, each individual need in each individual house is different. You may wish to start a small business. You may wish to fix your roof. You may wish to buy livestock. You may wish to get your kids back into school. No organization, international, local, is going to be able to answer those questions for you. The most radically respectful thing we can do is to get out the way, give unconditional cash, and let people address their own needs directly. Thanks, Rory. Uh, coincidentally, some of that is what Give Directly does, which I suppose is not a coincidence. Uh, we'll come back to interrogate. I, I work for an organization I believe in. I don't want to apologize for that. <laughs> uh, we'll come back to talk about some of, some of what you raised uh, shortly. Uh, I'd like to turn back to, to Hibak to talk about collaboration. Uh, you spoke of that earlier as, as, as an important part of, 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 of the way you see the future. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so I should say, um, with NIR being a network of over 280 organizations, um, it's, it's really important that I, I talk about, I think, the role that the Secretariat plays. And we, and we play three functions. Um, the first function is as a facilitator, the second is as a convener, and the third is as an advisor. And decisions are made by our members. And so when we think about any of our solutions or any of our approaches, we think about it in a collaborative way. Um, and to start, we, we work similar to, I think, what Christina said and Farouk said. It's not just about money. It's about representation. It's about power. And so we focus on two separate areas. We focus on policy influencing, and we focus on, on financing. Um, from the change fund and a little bit of what Degan said, we've been challenged by our members. We've been challenged by our members to think beyond one fund. We've been challenged to think reimagining the system. And so what we've been able to do, I think, over the last couple of months is have some really hard conversations with our members, with our partners, with our allies, of what a collaborative networked financing system or mechanism could look like. And for us, there are, I think, a, a few things that are really, really important for us to stress. Um, and, and it's a little bit about what, what Rory just said. It's about agency. It's about ensuring that the organizations who mostly are, are part of the communities have the agency to make a decision of what, what kind of funding their community needs, especially in a response. The second is, is to center everything that we do, I think, around local leadership. It's, we're not going to move towards the 25% without centering local, local actors um, within the new system. And then third, I think, what we've been able to do, and this is why we're, we purposefully have only taken foundation money in the beginning, is be very flexible and adaptable. To be able to say, here is the criteria, but we should be able to move around, and not from a due diligence perspective, but from an implementing perspective. And so all of those areas that we've been able to learn over the last couple of years would not have happened unless we had members in 29 countries, unless we had partners in 39 countries that felt like they had a voice within the network to be able to say, these are the things that we want to be changed immediately in the midterm and in the long term. And that's kind of the ethos and the essence of, of, of the way that NIR Network works. Thanks, Hibak. Uh, Dagan, let's, let's turn to you um, again about philanthropic donors. Why is why are you so heavily focused on, on philanthropic donors as opposed to the traditional bilateral donor government grants? Um, I think as a DESO, we have gone through um, a, a transition. Um, when I first came in 2003 to the organization um, that was founded by my mother, uh, Fatima Jibril, um, my hope and aspiration was to get bilateral funding. And that's what I worked really hard for. And eventually we succeeded. We got EU funding, we got USAID funding, um, we got um, Swedish funding, we got all types of funding. And we were probably the only Somali NGO that had um, broken through the glass ceiling <laughs> and actually gotten this kind of funding. Um, at the height of Odessa, I think in 2011, 2012, we had about $20 million in annual income. 
And, um, and then we made a massive pivot um, as a result of a few um, experiences that we had to saying, um, while we are doing advocacy as ADASO with the Grand Bargain and localization and the World Humanitarian Summit, and we led that movement on the 25%, um, that, that funding is gonna take a long time. It's like steering and moving the Titanic. Um, it's not an easy change. Samantha Power, I take my hat off to her. What she's trying to do is amazing, and we le love that leadership that she's providing with other bilaterals, and, um, and I hope that they are actually um, uh, following in her footsteps because the, 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 tar the target of 25% has died, and uh, she's put some life into it as a result of her recommitment. Um, but we all, I also know, as a recipient of USAID funding, um, how difficult it is to manage that grants. And, uh, and I would probably, if I could go back in time, I actually might have said to an INGO, you be the pastor, and you take that risk and you manage it, and let me just do my work and get on with it. Um, but that was a painful lesson learned, and uh, you know, but it was a really important lesson for me because I realized that the machinery is such that people are handicapped by Congress. You know, there are rules and regs there for a reason. And making a small little change to one policy might require some legislative support and a bill or something like that. It's not so easy. And and I was just very naive, thinking it's not they could change this or change that procurement policy or whatever. But it's not that easy. And once you understand and unravel this onion, you just start peeling and peeling and peeling. You just it's 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 never ending. And so um, so we realize that philanthropy honestly is um, flexible. Much of it is unrestricted. Philanthropy has led the charge in trust-based philanthropy. So, um, we know what Mackenzie Scott has done um, in terms of giving large size, unrestricted, purely unrestricted funding to Global South organizations, not just BIPOC groups in, in the U.S., but globally, including ADESO, that I was shocked to receive them. We received the Mackenzie Scott grant, and I was expecting that there would be all types of restrictions. There were zero restrictions, uh, and I was like, wait a minute, you can buy land? They were like, yep. I was like, you can do investments? Yep. And you were like, wait, you don't want any reports? Just one report a year. And then they discontinued the report. So now, actually, I want a relationship with them, and I can't even talk to them. <laughs> I want to report. I want to tell them this is all the amazing things that you guys have, your money has done. So it's like, it's, it's the extreme of trust. You know what you're doing. We don't need a reporting. We don't need accountability. Go on with your business. Bye. You know, we, you know, just, it's the, it, and, and the, you know what it's called? It's not called a grant. It's called a gift. And honestly, it feels like a gift. One day, I was reflecting on that word, what it means, the difference between a grant and a gift. And so, and it feels like a gift because it feels like I'm giving you money. When you give sadaqa in Islamic terms, when you give charitable giving, you don't sit there and try to micromanage what that person does with the gift that you've given them. You're trusting them. And so... That is where philanthropy, with the example of Mackenzie Scott, I, they're not all like Mackenzie Scott, <laughs> but they are far, far more flexible. And I think this is the role that philanthropy can play, is de-risking things that are very innovative, that are very outside the box kind of thinking that we are constantly coming up with. Local organizations might be under-resourced, but they are not... Um, undercapacitated with ideas. We are constantly innovating. We're constantly innovating. Um, people talk about innovation left, right, and center, and the people that innovate the most are the resource strapped communities. When you have a lot of resources, you don't innovate. When you have no resources, you're constantly innovating. And so, so that is where philanthropy can come in as a real partner to say, we'll take the risk, we'll do risk it for you, we'll help you establish this fund, we'll take that leap of faith, we'll help you raise the resources for this proximate fund, we'll help you give seed funding or design funding, and all of that, that bilaterals can't do. And then later, we can go to USAID and say, hey, are you ready to be a partner in this $200 million fund? 
that philanthropy has already invested in. And so, and, and we have a track record of giving. We have some metrics to show you. They have accountability to the people, the taxpayers. We understand that. So we will give you that, uh, track, that track record, those metrics, but we can only do that with the initial investment from philanthropy. And that's why I think philanthropy is so, so critical to the, art, to the ecosystem. Thanks, Dagan. Uh, Farouk, I'm going to turn to you quickly. Uh, are there things from, from the White Helmet experience that, that when it comes to finding funding uh, that you think other organizations can learn from? Direct funding, you mean? Uh, any sort of funding. Well, uh, of course, a lot of, Maybe, uh, my a lot of lesson learns. A lot of lesson learns, but uh, building on uh, what I believe our key uh, success factors and key challenges we have overcome, we learned that uh, we need always to maintain our legitimacy and relevance. So uh, I would advise to other local organizations, uh, don't rush, don't be hasty, you have to be uh, patient, build your capacity, don't follow the, the money, it's not that whatever funding opportunity you may have, you, you grab it, no. You should stay relevant to your cause, to your mission, and uh, within your uh, capacity to absorb funds. Build coalition, it helps a lot. You need the economy of scale. A single small local organization will, will never be able to meet all the donors' requirements. It's so sophisticated, they require too many staff and overheads. So it's much better for small organizations to work together, have a coalition that might take the, do the uh, admin work while they focus on the uh, technical uh, service delivery. Uh, and of course, stay uh, working hard on institutional capacity building, finance, governance, compliance. I know my colleagues talked already about them. But uh, um, I think one of the uh, important lessons we learned that uh, uh, we should remain open and diverse in our, in, in our own building and structure. A, lo a local organization doesn't need to be always on the local staff. So uh, we are very proud of our model and experience of having people from different countries, different uh, backgrounds, different places working together for a joint cause that, yes, it came from the ground, from, from the uh, field in Syria. But we uh, needed to uh, share experience, um, and we have people from everywhere working uh, together, and that helps to build that bridge to the international community and the uh, external donors. Thanks, Baruch. Uh Christina, I'll turn quickly to you, then over to Rory briefly. Uh, Rory talked about some of the inefficiencies in the system. Uh, and when we're talking about localization, we're talking about rectifying power imbalances. But how do you make sure those imbalances just aren't transferred to, to a different level? Um, how, do you, how do you make sure the, those inefficiencies don't get replicated just in a different model? So maybe that was loud. Um, so maybe two things. I think I'll go back to the first point. Um, well, the point that Hibak was making, um, and something that we very much subscribe to it at Start Network around collaboration, because I think you know power is a is a human trait. Um, taking power is a human trait, and I think you can get caught in a cycle of shifting power to different parts of the system. Um, but not dispersing power or sharing power. So I think the concept of um, collaboration, the concept of building social capital, is uh, the concept of, of collaboration over competition, I think is something that, um, that you can use to, to share that power and not to merely um, you know, devolve it down to different, to different levels. Um, in Start Network, for example, we talk a lot about um, sharing power and sharing risk. Um, you know, and sharing power, you know, we talk, we lobby with, um, all members lobby with one another to share 
their indirect cost recovery, so share the money that they get for their overheads in order to adopt a model where it's the tide, you know, getting money is the tide that lifts all boats. We get money for our organization, you get money for your organization, and together we mount a response that is that much more effective, that much more ethical, that much more efficient. Um, we talk about sharing risk, and I think I'm glad that, Dagan, you brought up the concept of risk um, in, you know, in your working with philanthropy, because I think in a conversation about humanitarian financing, to avoid the topic of risk is to avoid the big elephant in the room. I think, um, you know, our approaches, our current approaches to risk, whether you're talking about an institutional donor like USAID or a philanthropic organization, um, not all of them are like Mackenzie Scott's, um, you are talking about a, a model of, of risk that is, that hobbles local organizations and to me is the single largest impediment to getting financing um, closer to the ground or on the ground as, as, as quickly as possible. Um, risk and compliance measures are overly bureaucratic. Um, they're very, very expensive, and they operate based on a model, not the model that Farouk is talking about in terms of what do you see, you know, what do organizations have to bring to the table, but really about what organizations lack in terms of their ability to, um, to accommodate your needs as a donor. And so I think if there are funders in this room, and I know that there are a few, um, I think the single most thing, the, the greatest thing that you can do to improve this conversation is to really overhaul your... Uh, approach to risk, accountability, and compliance. And do it through the lens of, I guess what I would call proportionality, simplicity, and creativity. And you know, you saw, you heard a lot about um, what that looks like in practice from Dagan, but I mean, proportionality is really about looking at your compliance systems and what you need to know from the organizations that you fund. Calibrate that with the size of the organization and align it with the amount of money they're asking for, and get rid of everything else that you're not ever gonna look at or use, because it just puts a burden on those organizations that could be doing much better work um, through their operations. Um, in terms of simplicity, if an organization has already passed a due diligence through one of your peer organizations, why would you put them through that again to spend the money to do the work? Simplify it trade uh, information with that peer organization, passport that information to your own due diligence, and accept it as given, and share that information so that others can do the same. And then creativity. Um, you know, it, it, I think a lot of donors would require some reporting, um, but it doesn't always have to be the 30-page report or the log frame that everybody insists on when reporting on funds. Um, what if you sat down with the community and asked them, did you get the money that you needed and did it go to the right things? What if you know you reported through video testimonials? What if you reported through um, yeah quiet, quiet conversations? I don't think everything has to be um, as onerous and as expensive as it is. Um, if you do have, if your organization does require that level of of uh, compliance, then fund your organizations in order to be able to meet those compliance standards, including the intermediary organizations that may be taking on some of that burden. Um, and then finally, just talk um, to your organizations about the value they bring, not the deficits they have. Because funding organizations is not riskier, it's just different. And the evidence bears that out, and my uh, experience at Start Network bears that out too. Thanks. Thanks, Christina. Uh, Rory, I'll turn quickly to you. Uh, you've heard uh, a lot about some of these ideas, and a lot of these things are, are, are not new. There, there are things that people have been asking for for, for years. From your time in, in government, I'm, I'm wondering how, is, is, does any of this get through? Is, it, uh, is any of it realistic? Uh, is there an appetite to, to do the things that people are asking for? I, I think the, the first thing to bear in mind, of course, for the government is that you are very, very much conscious that you're spending money from taxpayers and you are subject to a very hostile, increasingly populist, increasingly isolationist media environment. Things are worse now than they were 10, 15 years ago. Aid budgets are being cut in Britain, they're being cut in Sweden, they're being cut in Northern Europe, they're likely to be cut in the United States. We do not have populations that are keen to give money to other people. The 0.7% target is fading. Uh, the global commitment to addressing extreme poverty is much less strong than it was 10 or 20 years ago. Civil society movements, churches, trade unions are weaker than they were 20 or 30 years ago. So the context is not good. And this is a problem. 
because it means that you are dealing with publics who are deeply, deeply skeptical about aid expenditure. Everybody in this room, I think, I would hope, agrees very strongly that we should be localizing aid much more. I think localizing not just to national NGOs, but to the most local possible NGOs, and I believe, obviously, actually down to individuals themselves. But the biggest challenge that we face is that inevitably, there are going to be scandals. There are going to be big, big scandals. An increasing number of the world's poor live in fragile, conflict-affected states. Everybody in this room should know that an enormous amount of aid money goes missing, and we don't report on it, and we're not transparent about it. But eventually, media, press find out about it. And there will be scandals of abuse. Recipient safeguarding will not be upheld in many cases. Money will be stolen. Uh, ludicrous programs will be designed with good intentions with very, very few impacts on the ground. And that will get back to media and voters at home. So. I would seriously say that we have to be, and this is where I'm slightly pushing back against some of the narratives in the room, the way to make this transition is to hold the local organizations to very, very high standards for their own sake. The only way that we will be able to make this transition is if we can demonstrate that local organizations are at least as effective, I would argue, must be more effective. I mean, the argument for local organizations has to be that they know more, care more, can do more. So we need to be able to demonstrate through randomized control trials that more of the money given to the local organization arrives on the ground with the recipient than is the case for an international organization. We need to be very, very careful to make sure that they are protected, unfortunately, against fraud, against sexual abuse. And I, I'm worried that trying to get rid of some of the bureaucracy may end up causing a problem which we don't want, which is a rapid amount of money flowing into local organizations without the appropriate compliant mechanisms in place, if it then results in scandals, will put this whole movement back five or 10 years. So I would argue for absolutely demonstrating that local organizations are cleaner, better, more accountable, more effective than the international organizations and making sure that they're judged on those metrics, not on the fact that they're local. Uh, I would wonder about the cost of, of, of doing this, and there has been that research for, for several years now, and it's really hard to, to compare across countries, across contexts. But I want to flip some of those points back to anyone on this panel. Do you, do you have thoughts on Yeah, I would like to respond to that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Rory. <laughs> I have to push back. Um, my first experience with fraud was with a UN staffer, okay, in Somalia. D D I, I, the international no, community just, is, is steals money, wastes no, money, I'm, just, I'm, I'm, not, just, I'm not denying I, but that. But this that, is yeah. a narrative I've been hearing for 20 years, honestly. Black and brown people always steal are risky. I'm, I'm, I'm sick of it, I'm sorry. D Degen, can I be very clear, because that is absolutely not what I'm saying. I began by saying the international community is corrupt, inefficient, ineffective. The global north wastes money, steals money, squanders money. Okay. But we I live but that. we live in an international context yes, in I, which that in a populist environment is very, very sensitive. Yeah. And what we cannot allow is the other narrative to develop and we okay. have to protect against so it. So what I would like to say, what I'm going to give you is a live example um, of what happened. We reported a fraud scandal with a local NGO um, that was a sub to us in Somalia in twenty eleven. We, we kind of whistle blue on ourselves and said this local NGO, every single INGO that we know, including UNICEF, was partnering with them. So we assumed it's a famine, everybody has to move fast. We had a gun held to our head by donors saying it's a famine, move the money, burn it, burn it, burn it. And so we partnered with this organization, not doing proper due diligence because of speed, assuming all these INGOs and UN agencies had done due diligence. We partnered with them found out there was fraud. I, being very naive, went to the international community and said, yeah, there was fraud. We investigated it, we admitted it, we, we thought we would be applauded. Good job, Degen, for being honest, right? Do you know what happened to Adesso? We were blacklisted. Adesso was blacklisted. 
simultaneously, an INGO, I will not name names, had a massive fraud scandal, much larger in scale than us, much larger. Okay, you know what happened to them? The donors worked really hard backstage to hide their fraud and not let it become public and not get into the Guardian and the New York Times. And their funding actually like quadrupled in Somalia, quadrupled. So let's just be honest here, okay? There's a couple of issues. One, the proportion of risk is different. When you are giving 99% or more of your funding to UN agencies and INGOs, the risk factor is much higher with international agencies. We get a little bit, we get like a drop, right? So even if we steal all of it, the proportion of the risk is much higher with them. That's the reality, right? The second reality is, is that the international donors are in cahoots with the UN and the INGOs to ensure that there is no repercussions for these entities. And what happened in Somalia, not only did it affect Adesso being blacklisted, all local NGOs, we were all guilty by association by the mere fact that we were all local in Somalia. We couldn't be trusted. So funding for local NGOs in Somalia went down significantly because of that one incident. And you know what I was told by an INGO country director? I sat with him and I said, hey, we investigated, we found this out, I want to go public with it. He told me, don't do it. They can hide it. That's what he told me. And I said, what? We all know there's some fraud happening. We all know there's problems happening. Why don't we all bring it up? And if you talk about it, I talk about it, everybody talks about it, then maybe we'll finally get to the root of the problem and clean the house. Uh, no, he was like, you're, I'm sorry to say you're being very naive. And I was extremely naive. I was shocked by the reaction. But that is systematically what happens. But, but Deng, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I think just to clarify, the point that I'm making is about the domestic political context. Yes. Right? It's very, very difficult to get voters in Europe and North America to put money into international development. And the problem isn't the reality. You're absolutely right. The reality is that the UN agencies, the international NGOs, are responsible for far more of the fraud and the waste than any local NGO ever. But we are in an environment which is extremely hostile to international development. And so it is extremely important for the sake of protecting the brand that we don't take shortcuts. And this is where I'm slightly pushing back on your point. I, I totally agree with you. But remember, there's a, a contradiction between the two of you. You talked about the fact that effectively you had passported a local NGO that had been endorsed by an international NGO that was giving it money over to yourself, and you found that they were involved in fraud. One of the reasons why I think that we have to, unfortunately, even though it's expensive, do quite complex compliance mechanisms for local NGOs as well as international is just to protect people from the political fallout. But maybe if I could respond too. I think what we're not saying, well, what I'm not saying at least, is that um, it is not our responsibility to be good with money. It is not our responsibility to get money on the ground where it's needed. I think that is one of our humanitarian imperatives along with helping people and protecting people from, from suffering. and and um, And... But I think what, what I am saying is that we have, to, we have to take a measure of proportionality here. We have to look at, as Dagan was saying, we have to look at the risk that we're looking at and react in, in proportionate ways. We cannot put undue burdens on organizations, hold them to a higher standard. Why should we hold them to a higher standard? Why shouldn't we hold everybody to the same standard or to a standard that is proportionate to the risk that they pose? This is not to say that financial good financial management is not, uh, is not important, that fraud is not a red line. It's just that look at what you're asking people to do and isn't their time and their money and their effort and their creativity and ingenuity better spent working on behalf of people in crisis and not working in back offices to service the British public that is maybe not, that, that, that doesn't feel that they should be defunding international aid. Thanks. Thanks, Christina. Uh, Marsha, you wanted to weigh in. Yeah, um, wading into the middle of this. Um, uh, and also because I have to slip out and run up the street to the next meeting, of course. But truly, really, you know, uh, respect and appreciate the candor and um, how the ball is being lobbed back and forth across the net here. So, so thank you. Um, and, you know, what a searing journey this is, right? I mean, everyone is still, like, learning as we go. And thank you just kind of remembering where we were 12 years ago on this topic to where I think we are today, for better or for worse. More easy to describe the development budgets the humanitarian assistance budgets, which have always been pretty robust because at least in the United States, there is a bipartisan effort to like 
alleviate suffering, save hot lives. That has, that has been sort of a common shared goal, but when you put it in some of these contexts, boy, does it become highly political, right? And I think we, as you know, at least from the humanitarian point of view, as principled humanitarian response, got to protect the local actors too from that scrutiny. So maybe it does translate into like, help me make your best arguments. So what can, what can I hear from you? What can you show me in terms of metrics to know that we can invest in you? So it may be seen as ugh, onerous and burdensome, but it's part of the building, building the defensive structure. I know. Then pay um, for it, then help them pay for it. Well, that's what I'm saying. And that's what I was talking about in my remarks was, it, whatever we give you in terms of funding has to be accompanied with the ability to manage, the ability to account for it, it's, you know, and that we can do all the overheads and this and that, but it's like, it is irresponsible for us to be giving anybody resources and then walk away. Uh, I mean, ideally, yes, but it's like, but if I'm not confident that, you know, if there was an audit, you would pass, it's on me too. You know, that's why I'm saying it's shared responsibility, successes and risks. Let's talk about that. Um, so I hear you on these. Um, the one thing though I did want to say, because also it's a little bit like, oh, those big agencies get to take the walk. Not so much now. Um, we have seen, obviously, with the unfortunate cases, and it's, it's in the media, so Marsha's not giving away a secret here, you know, the, the, the unfortunate cases of diversion in the Horn of Africa, you know, there were some really tough and raw conversations taking place with those UN agencies now. You know, with their systems, their processes, our systems, our processes. So that is a little bit of that internal review. So please, you know, be assured there is a scrub going on that at the end of the day, it's not the local organization that's 100% culpable or right or vulnerable. There are others that play in this ecosystem, and they have to hold themselves to these high standards too. So the, the tough conversations are at all levels now, for better or for worse. But again, um, I appreciate just the willingness of the candor of this conversation, because all of this has to go into what we're doing next. Um, so keep investing in the conversations and dialogues with us, please. Um, again, there is this internal process, which I will not give you the acronym, um, but, but it is, there's urgency behind it. There is, there is um, scrutiny on it internally, and we have expectations on this thing. And I just have to make sure it really delivers for everybody. Thanks so thank you. you. Gotta run. Thank you. Farouk, you wanted to, to, to jump in? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's been an interesting discussion, just pressing on the shared responsibility to call to Marsha. Because mistakes will happen, definitely, no matter how much due diligence we do, mistakes may happen. But donors should share responsibility when that mistake is because of their short-term planning, uh, lack of capacity building, lack of uh, core support for sustainability, whatever, because these small organizations, they don't have the capacity exactly to, to fill all the gaps. There will be mistakes, of course, but the, the, no donors need to be, be brave to recognize what led to that mistake, why this happened because that organization was not able to hire competent staff or to work on their capacity or have longer term planning and internal procedures because yeah, all these resources which are traditionally allocated to cover these gaps goes to the international partner while the local organizations are left alone but they take the highest quality. So when mistakes happen, donors also should share the responsibility for it. Thanks for speaking of risk sharing, and thanks, Marcia. Uh, speaking of risk sharing, uh, Rory, you spoke about about this this need to, to shield uh, local NGOs. Um, is there, uh, you know, as as give directly, you've also weathered storms in terms of aid diversion recently. Uh, is there something that an organization like Give Directly or someone in in your position can do, or something concrete? to share that risk with local organizations? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. So we, we've just been through a scandal in DRC, so Eastern DRC, and just to quickly talk you through what happened. Uh, and, and this relates, I think, to a bigger problem in the industry. So this is a, a very bad conflict-affected area of Eastern DRC, and we decided on security grounds that recipients would not have to register their own mobile telephones. Instead, staff would do it for them. Over the course of 14 months, our staff, uh, proceeded to steal the money that was supposed to be going to recipients. They effectively helped themselves to the SIM cards that were meant to be in the hands of recipients, and they paid themselves instead of paying the recipients. Um, and we've had a sort of fascinating journey on this because, of course, we began by saying, look, this is only 0.6% of our 
expenditure last year. We spent $200 million last year. This was about $900,000. And do we really want to put in many more procedures and spend more money preventing the fraud than we actually lost in the fraud? Um, in the end, we've decided, yes, we do want to spend more money preventing the fraud than we lost in the fraud because our, the trust that you have in receiving money from other people is, is very sacred. And sometimes it is justified to spend more money preventing losing money that you actually would lose in the money. Um, what have we learned through this process? Well, I think the first thing, and this is why maybe I'm sort of sharing this, the damage to our organization is intense. Right? We can provide any number of explanations for why we made a particular exception in Eastern DRC and why things went wrong. The truth of the matter is it is deeply, devastatingly damaging to an organization to lose money. It's also true, as Degan says, as soon as we found out the fraud, we published it on the blog. We went out to journalists. We gave an immediate exclusive to the new humanitarian. We did nothing to hide it. Uh, and of course, we feel a little bit bitter about sitting in organizations with international NGOs where they look around the table and say, what's the all? fraud and diversion rate? And we say 0.6%. And all the most famous NGOs in the world say 0%, right all the way around the table. Okay, So it's, it's a very, very weird ecosystem. But all, all I can say is that my lesson from this is if you're doing something radical, as we are with direct cash transfer, or as the localization agenda is doing, right, doing something that is challenging the system, you have to be that much more careful because people are gunning for you. They're going to jump on the first possible opportunity to say, oh, well, that's why we should return to the old system. And that's why you have to be even more careful. And, and, and I think I'm going to be quiet, but I mean, I think if I had one message that I'd want to get across, it's in the end, this is all about recipients first. The danger of this conversation is we're talking about the intermediary organizations. In the end, the only question really that matters is what is in the best interest of recipients. And I believe strongly that local organizations are much more likely to deliver good, efficient outcomes for recipients. But that's the way in which they should be judged. Can I just ask you, Rory, a question? As a result of that experience in DRC, did your funding decrease? Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. Like uh, what percentage? Difficult to assess, but definitely there are donors who were about to sign contracts who did not sign contracts. There will be other people that it's difficult to assess, philanthropists who may have decided not to give us money. Many of the conversations I've had in the last six months have been around, didn't you lose money in DC? And it's not, it's not good for an organization mm -hmm. to lose money. And the fact that we believe that we're losing much less money than most other international NGOs, and we're much more transparent about it. Boy, it doesn't feel like that. Mm. The reason I ask is, is that if a local NGO had had that experience, they would have been blacklisted and had to shut down. That's just the reality, I'm sorry to say. And all local organizations in DRC would have seen their funding plummet. So I know exactly what you mean. We have a higher standard that we have to he adhere. We've, I've known that. It's the same problem being black in America. You always have to perform extra. Um, to get into a leadership role. We know this, we know the scrutiny is on us, but the issue is not the scrutiny, the issue is the response when something happens and the perceptions. The problem is on that side of white power holders who have the resources, who make these judgment calls and kind of excuse and let it pass when it's a white-led organization and never give that level of um, flexibility to black and brown-led organizations. Let's just call it what it is, it's pure racism. And is there, going back to sharing that risk to make sure organizations like Adesso don't go through what they went through, um, what can someone in your position or an organization in your position with deeper pockets, uh, more networks, what can they do to, to be an umbrella, to sh split that risk? I mean, it's, it's, I mean th this, this is a very, 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 very difficult conversation um, because, again, all we care about is are the recipients getting, ideally, $93 out of every $100 that somebody given that she arrives on their phone? And are they treated respectfully? And are they safe? And are they not being abused? And it's really difficult to guarantee those things. It's very difficult to know enough about local leadership, to know enough about local partners, to be confident, particularly in a war zone. Very difficult to know what's going on. Um, and I, I don't want to get into a sort of 
ideological setup. I agree with Degan. I mean, the system has a lot of racism built into it. It's, it's much easier, obviously, for me to defend a fraud situation. But there's also, there's not just racism, there's class, there's contacts, there's networks, there's a lot of murky stuff in the background that allows um, things to, to be got away with. Um, but, but we still can't overcome the fundamental problem which faces everybody, whether they're international or national, which is, I, I do think, if I want to be really radical, the real problem I, I don't think unconditional cash transfer is the answer to everything, but I think it's an answer to many, many things. In a world that's worried about colonialism, patronizing attitudes, global north, global south, there is nothing more radically respectful than saying we are literally giving, we're not going to ask the extreme poor what they want, we're not going to consult with the local leadership, we're not going to do a needs assessment, we're going to literally just give you the cash unconditionally and let you do what you think is best for the money. Okay, I'm just very conscious of the time. Uh, I just want to give everyone uh, an opportunity to say 30 seconds about their what their point. Rory, I'm just going to... I'm going to stop. I've talked <laughs> enough. Yes, I'm just, I will count that as yours. Uh, Farouk, let's go with you. Well, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was interesting. <laughs> and uh, continuous uh, engagement and partnerships across North and South is very important. I don't see this uh, uh, there should be a kind of uh, competition or comparison between uh, organization in North and uh, South. We can do a lot uh, together and uh, uh, advocacy should continue because uh, uh, this is a long term uh, struggle to change and transform the system itself, not a single grant or a single uh, fund. And uh, I believe uh, there is a, a lot of good willing and potential partners on both sides who want to work together to overcome these challenges. Thanks for, uh, Christina. Yeah, really hard to sum this up. Um, I guess what I would say is, um, for me this conversation has been about and should be about um, the best use of the funds that we have, the limited funds that we have um, in all aspects and in our accounting for them, in our management of them and making sure that they get to the ground quickly and in the hands of the people that can do the most good with them. I also think this is a conversation about value and recognizing where value sits in the system. And it doesn't always sit with the power holders. It sits with the people who know the most, who have the most expertise, who have the most experience, who have the deep roots in the communities. And it's about recognizing that value and rewarding that value with um, the funds, with the voice, with the, with the platforms, so that they are able to tell the world about it. Um, I guess I'll leave it there. Well, maybe, well, sorry, one last point on collaboration. I think that's been a theme here as well. Um, several panelists have, have remarked on it because I think that it is in the diversity of our sector, international, national, and local, um, all collaborating, all operating, all influencing the agenda together where we will see the needle move on what we're trying to do. Thanks. Thanks, Christina. Dagan? I think um, this is going to be shocking when I say this, but I think real allyship is, if we're really serious about this work, is when a situation like what happened to Give Directly happens, we come out and we strongly support Give Directly because we all recognize we are Give Directly. Everything like this happens in every single institution. And next time you have a fraud or mismanagement issues, go out and be very, very public about it. And to me, I think the more we start talking about these issues, the more we start talk, you know, putting all of our skeletons out of the closet, the more we can have a more honest conversation. Right now, there is no real honest conversation because the reality is everybody's hiding their skeletons. Everybody is. Um, that DevEx article was completely imbalanced. Um, the UN threw the entire Somali community under the bus for their problems um, in that DevEx article rather than saying, oops, we messed up. We know that we are part of the problem. There's been massive fraud happening in Somalia for the past 30 years. We all know it as Somalis, but rather than doing that, they just said it's the locals, the politicians, the businessmen, blah, 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 blah. No mention of the UN agencies. I can tell you almost all the UN agencies in Somalia are corrupt. I'll tell you that right now. And nobody has put them on the hot seat. Just admit it. Just be honest and admit it and say we made mistakes and let's try to fix it instead of throwing locals under the bus all the time. So just like I will be in solidarity with Give Directly, when a local NGO and DRC has issues, we all should be in solidarity with them. 
unless they're genuinely corrupt. But if they made a mistake because nobody funds their back office, nobody, everybody tells them to burn money quickly and to do the impossible with almost no resources, something will go wrong. It's also our, uh, we are to blame. When a crisis happens right now in Libya, and we pump in millions and millions of dollars to very few local organizations, and we tell them to burn the money in six months, what do you think is going to happen? You created the problem, and then when a problem happens, then you say, ooh, you locals, you can't be trusted. So let's admit that these problems happen, and let's take responsibility for it, and let's stop hiding it. Thank you, Dagan. How Goodbye. do I follow that? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, ju just to say, I mean, I think what Marsha said, I I'm really appreciative of the, of the candor, actually. Uh, you very rarely get this on a panel. Um, but just to say, I think to the point before, um, I don't think more bureaucratic processes are the answer. I actually think that the answer is around contextualization. And I think that we really need to consider certain policies don't make sense in certain places. Um, and so I think we need to think through what are solutions based off of experiences, real experiences, candid conversation, to be able to, 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 to create solutions. Um, but I, I think making it harder in the humanitarian system and, um, and, and not focusing on why we started 70 years ago and how USAID or UK aid or any of these agencies started and why they started, I think is a huge issue. So I think we need to probably historically go back and see why we did this and how we did it in the beginning and, 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 and go back to that. Thanks so much. Uh, I think we're like half an hour over, so we, <laughs> I'm getting those signs. But thank you everyone for joining us. I really appreciate the candor. Thank you.